Dr. Sébastien Minot, who has um, obtained um, both the CAPES and aggregation and is currently working as a TA at the University de, uh, of Tours, uh, working at the moment on his doctoral thesis entitled Identité télévisuelle post-placard, États-Uniens gays en représentation et politique de visibilité under the supervision of uh, Georges Claude. So today, your presentation uh, is about black gay characters at the intersection of post-racial and post-gay discourses in one, two, three different uh, shows that you have on the program. My savior. <laughs> oh. yes. okay. Comment ça marche ah, Oui, je voudrais séparer les deux écrans. Hein. Non, non, c'est ici. Non. Euh... On aurait dû en parler avant. Oui. C'est là. Oui, voilà. Ah d'accord, donc là je fais glisser ce que je veux que vous voyez à droite, c'est ouais. ça Ok. Euh, je peux fermer ça Comment je ferme ça Rassembler les fenêtres, non Non, non, bah non. Je tu ferme là Ah oui, je mets ailleurs, d'accord. Voilà. Très bien. Ok. Voilà. Lecture, lecture. Là, comme ça. Ah, mais ça s'affiche sûrement aussi sur celui-là. Comment ça se fait euh. Bon, sinon, je peux le changer comme ça. Parce que tu l'avais pas imprimé. Tiens. Non. Hop. Il faut faire lecture, lecture, uh -huh. en, en haut, en haut. Ici tout en, Non, non, tout en haut, au-dessus euh, de lecture. Là Lancez le diaporama. Mais là, ça le lance aussi sur mon écran. Oui, et pourquoi vous ne voulez pas qu'on le lance sur votre écran Non, je voudrais avoir mon texte. Oh là là Ah, d'accord. Ok. Il faut deux. Comme ça. Oui, oui, oui. c'est pas, pas plus grand. Non, non, c'est très bien. Oui. Donc là, vous mettez le lecture, relancez le diaporama. Lire en haut. Oui, hop là. Ok, on va y arriver. <rire> très bien. Sorry about that. Ok. So, in Touching, Feeling, Affect, um, Pedagogy, Performativity, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick described how, in the summer of 1991, a protest was being held against the University of North Carolina's um, local PBS station because it refused to air Marlon Riggs's documentary, Tongs and Tide, about the intersection of being both black and gay. Sedgwick decried um, the almost Gen genocidally underrepresented topic of black gay men in the United States and the apparently unrepresentably dangerous and endangered conjunction queer and black. In fact, before Noah's Ark first aired in October 2005, um, there were no black gay TV shows uh, and black gay characters were few and far between, 
let alone lead or recurring characters, to the notable exception of Keith from Six Feet Under and Carter from Spin City. Since then, as the adage would have it, things have gotten better, uh, numerically at least. Uh, I have chosen to focus my analysis on four different TV shows, Noah's Ark, Sirens, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, and Empire. Although these four shows feature black gay characters, they are quite different from each other, um, both in terms of genre and location within the televisual landscape. Noah's Ark was an original Logo production, and it aired on Logo, a gay channel, and was canceled after two successful seasons, much to the chagrin of its viewers. It is an ensemble show, uh, ensemble show revolving uh, around the lives of four out black gay men. Sirens and Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt were broadcast respectively. Oh, oh yeah, that was, uh, I forgot about my PowerPoint. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was supposed to be stats about the increasing visibility of black gay men uh, on TV. Uh, so they're both taken from um, GLAD reports, where we're on TV, published um, yearly. One is from 2006, 2007, the other is this year's. Um, and as you can see, um, back in the 2006-2007 season. Um, of the nine series regular gay and lesbian characters on the broadcast networks this season, eight are white and one, the supporting character of Oscar on NBC's The Office is Latino. Of the 25 LGBT characters on cable, seven are people of color. Even with these representations, LGBT viewers of color will have a hard time finding fair, accurate, and inclusive images of their lives and culture and programming this year, says Monica um, Tyre, Glad's People of Color media director. Um, yes. Uh, so, Sirens and Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt were broadcast respectively on USA Network, a pay subscription channel, and on Netflix. They both feature a black gay character who is integrated with other white straight characters. Uh, Empire is a soapy drama on Fox, currently in its sixth season, uh, and narrates the rise to fame and success of the Lion family. Jamal is one of uh, Lucius and Kuki's uh, three sons, and he is gay. The election of Barack Obama and the strides may, made in LGBTQ plus rights uh, over the past decade, um, such as Obergefell v. Hodge, um, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, et cetera, have uh, led some to label the era with epithets such as post-gay um, or post-racial uh, in the same way they used post-feminist, thus denying the legitimacy of the kind of identity politics um, that has made such progress possible. Now, although um, those who have heralded um, the dawn of this new era have seen their claims challenged, um, for instance, by the election of Donald Trump, um, the post-discourses uh, still have traction and help shape the way these identities are represented. This paper will focus on how this conjunction, to use um, Sedgwick's term, of being black and gay is inflected in these various American TV shows. First, in a context where discourses uh, which give credence to the advent of a post-racial and post-gay era, um, I will attempt to show how representations are still very much identity-based and rely on long-standing tropes, uh, most importantly when it comes to notions of authenticity, quote unquote. Um, authenticity coerces characters into strict um, often essentializing identity scripts that confront characters with um, irreconcilable double binds. In fact, some of these identities, as is the case with gayness and blackness, tend to be conceived as mutually exclusive. How then is it possible to feature such representational um, paradoxes in televisual writing? As it turns out, 
the most common controlling image in Patricia Hill Collins' words of black gay men runs counter to claims of authenticity and paints black gay men as imposters. However, the interstices open by the seeming incompatibility of those identities and by the depiction of black gay men as inherently fraudulent uh, create spaces from which to resist these dominant scripts, deroutinize those identities and disidentify from them. The characters from this corpus are all very much identity-based, whether it be intentional or not. Um, they tend to invalidate uh, the claims of post-gay and post-racial discourses. In two notable instances, Titus from Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt uh, refers to the importance of the lived experience of blackness and gayness. Um, so gay, black, and old, I don't even know um, which box to check on the hate crime form points to the um, intersectionality of his identity. And in episode eight from season one, I've decided to live as a werewolf. What? It's so much easier than being an African-American man. Security guards don't follow me around in stores. Um, dogs have stopped barking at me, and no one mistook me for Samuel L. Jackson all day. And later in the episode, um, I got treated better as a werewolf than I ever did as a black man. In these lines, Titus points to how hard the experience of both blackness and gayness is. Um, even though it wasn't until the second season um, that Noah's Ark addressed the challenges black gay men have to face, most notably gay bashing and police harassment, Noah's Ark may have been a tad to identity-centered, um, but it was still lauded for putting an end to the symbolic annihilation to which black gay men, black gay men had thus far uh, been subjected and for portraying a variety of iterations of black gayness. Much in the same way, Jamal's troubles stem from his identity as a black gay man. His father, Lucius, um, forbids him from coming out, falsely ascribing this prescription to a benevolent concern for his career. And throughout the first season, Jamal cannot bring himself to come out of the closet. Thus, the identity-obsessed closet trope is one of the most important defining features of the character. The end of the first season culminates in his coming out to his father and the rest of the world, um, and the rest of the world, singing quite um, palimpsestuously one of his father's songs with a couple of alterations. In Sirens, uh, the coming out issue is addressed in the very first scene of the first episode of the first season. Paradoxically enough, Hank from Sirens, unlike the other characters mentioned above, um, is a less overtly identity-based character. Uh, and while Jamal, Jamal Titus, uh, or the characters from Noah's Ark, all allude to the experiences of being black and gay, the strategy deployed in Sirens is much more in line with post-gay discourses. Hank is presented as one of the boys and the distinctiveness of his experience as a black gay man is downplayed. Instead, much in accordance with the kind of assimilationist politics championed by post-gay and post-racial discourses, the emphasis is laid on sameness, on the traits the characters have in common. And I will now show you the sequence, if it works. Who do I got a thing for? The new anchor on Action News. A little blonde girl, she's cute. Yeah. I was thinking an idea that should be nice behind the scenes, like the crew would love you, know what I mean? Do you know who I got a thing for? A uh, new sports guy on WGN. That guy? I don't think he's gay, dude. Oh, he's gay. How do you know? He knows. He's the dick whisperer. Yes, I am. Besides, it's like what he last week. Shut up. All right, you two. I need you to go down to headquarters. You got a new guy coming on the rake. And you best be on time. I hear he's an ex-Navy SEAL. Okay. No, that's for later. Um, this sequence might not be formalized as a conventional coming out scene, but as compulsory um, heterosexuality dictates, um, until shown otherwise, a character who is donning any of the stereotypical signifiers of gayness will most likely be assumed to be straight. The seemingly benign conversation about their respective taste in news anchors performs the function of a coming out for viewers, but 
in framing it in a conversation in which a straight man and a gay man both share their opinions about object choices, the distinctiveness of Hank's identity is minimized. The apparent contradiction between the assertion of a gay identity uh, in the form of a coming out of sorts and a willingness to focus on what the characters have in common echoes the tension between post-gay discourse and what Ron Becker termed straight panic. Becker states that the increase in gay visibility on TV in the US in the 1990s and early 2000s uh, through straight America in a state of straight panic over existing sexual categories and created an obsession with maintaining a firm gay straight line. Being the very first scene of the show, this scene exemplifies just how firmly, firmly this line was to be drawn. Now, dominant narratives of blackness and gayness both give credence to the notion of authenticity. When applied to blackness, um, authenticity seems to be associated with the performance of masculinity, homophobia, and class status. According to Connell's taxonomy of masculinities, black masculinities, in so much as they are racialized, are considered marginal um, and subordinate to hegemonic masculinity, hence the emphasis on authenticity, which is constantly called into question. Um, a particular form of blackness created and sustained by the trope of authenticity um, has become hegemonic in uh, current U.S. society. Uh, in its current form, authentic blackness um, has uh, increasingly become linked to masculinity in its most patriarchal significations. This particular brand of masculinity epitomizes um, the imperialism of heterosexism, sexism, and homophobia. Also, um, the romanticized view of working class as authentic renders middle class educated blacks as ass um, assimilated, capitulated, and inauthentic. Furthermore, an inner city lifestyle is associated with black authenticity. These are two quotes from Queering, Queering Blackness in Noah's Ark from um, queer pop culture. As argued in these two quotes, um, authentic blackness is necessarily linked to a particularly patriarchal version of masculinity. This strict version of authentic blackness is further complicated by class status. Such a specific definition of authentic blackness makes it hard to perform and easy to stray from. So much so that Philip Brian Harper has claimed that black gay characters have often served to buttress um, often specifically in challenging normative conceptions of race, sexuality, and gender identity. Much in the way of Vita Russo's Yars Sixtis, who, who served to measure the virility of the men around them. The trope of authenticity does not apply only to blackness. The closet paradigm relies on strict binarisms as well as notions of authenticity. Um, and rests on a, ride, a rigid identity script too. The threshold between authentic and inauthentic, between living a lie and living your truth, is materialized by the ritual of the coming out. Um, the closet, though, um, as illustrated in the article um, titled Beyond the Closet as Raceless Paradigm, is all too often taken to be a universalizing feature of gayness and obscures the distinctive aspects that coming out can assume when dealing with racialized characters. As a result of these identities being mutually exclusive, the quest for authenticity often turns out, in the case of black gay men, to be a fool's errand. In fact, oftentimes, in striving to perform one of their identities authentically, they alienate the other and end up with fractured identities. Titus is a good example of a fractured identity. As it happens, Titus Andromedon is not Titus's real name. His birth name is Ronald Wilkerson, but he changed it when he moved from Mississippi to the big city to come out of the closet and become a big star. Uh, those are his words. Um, thus disrupting the continuities between his black cl closet itself from the South uh, and his fabulous out self in New York. Titus's blackness is hardly ever mentioned or treated as relevant in the diegesis, um, the two aforementioned quotes accepted. 
he is never represented as an interaction, uh, in an interaction uh, with other black people, let alone black gay men, or in the context of a black gay community. Noah's Ark um, offers another interesting example of the irreconcilability of gayness and blackness in Ricky's character. On various occasions, Ricky uh, makes uh, sissyphobic remarks and shames one of the characters for being femme. Sissyphobia may seem a convenient way of reconciling black patriarchal masculinity and gay masculinity, but in attempting to close the gap between uh, his two identities, he is instantly checked by his friends, some of whom, like Noah, are not conventionally masculine and do not try to be. Femphobic tendencies can also be found in Hank, especially when he makes a reference to his ex-boyfriend's new fiance, um, who is, in Hank's opinion, a sissified version of moi, uh, him. Another fracture in Hank's identity can be found in his appearance. As the series revolves around the professional occupations of the characters, Hank is mostly shown in his very neutral um, paramedic uniform. Clark and Turner argue that appearance constitutes a primary way of asserting and displaying a lesbian and gay identity. Lesbians and gay men use clothing and adornment to create a sense of group identity, um, separate from the dominant culture, to resist and challenge normative gendered expectations, and to signal their sexual identity to the wider world or just to those in the know. In this professional context, Hank finds himself um, stripped of any kind of accessory or adornment uh, that would signify his sexuality. The fragmentation and the impossible irreconcilability of the identities of black gay men have caused them to be represented as imposters, as fraudulent, all too often in order to make black masculinity and white heterosexuality more authentic. Charles I. Nero, um, mentioning the work of scholar E.P. Johnson, puts it as follows. The imposter, which also includes the sexually voracious black stud who is not really a gay man since he exists only to satiate white male desire, is the predominant controlling image of black gay men. The imposter is similar to the caricatures of black gay men that E. Patrick Johnson discusses in his dazzling work, Appropriating Blackness, using examples such as uh, the Men On skit uh, in the 80s television show uh, In Living Color, the black power writings by Eldridge Clever and Amiri, Amiri uh, Baraka, uh, and the performances by the comic Eddie Murphy, Johnson shows how such caricatures uh, work to signify black masculinity and, in effect, heterosexuality as authentic and black homosexuality as trivial, ineffectual, and indeed inauthentic. The trope of the black gay man as imposter dies hard. And even in more recent TV shows, characters give in to, those, um, to these long-lasting stereotypes. In keeping with what I said before about the way Sirens emphasizes sameness between Hank and the other characters, in particular with Johnny, Hank's version of masculinity is conventional. It even presents the required amount of femphobia. And it is deemed believable by his coworkers. However, in an episode titled Itsy Bitsy Spider, uh, in which he is shown uttering high-pitched screams elicited by the presence of a spider on his shoulder. The following scene shows a female character removing the spider. Um, she and Hank's two co-workers make fun of him, feminizing him and telling him what he needs, uh, that what he needs is a tiara. Hank's feminization in that scene reactivates associations between femininity and homosexuality, which happen to be a source of ridicule. Hank is one of the boys and can remain so as long as he does not deviate from the conventional script of masculinity. Titus is the opposite of Hank and does not try to be authentic at all. He constantly blurs the line between identity and performance, between reality and fiction, so much so that I, I would be hard pressed to list them all here. Um, so in the interest of time, I will use as an example his willingness to live as a werewolf um, or that, contrary to what he claimed, he did move to the big city but never actually came out. Titus also uses inauthenticity as a coping mechanism in order to distance himself from the harshness of his condition. Um, in his own words, he is gay, black, and old. As Munoz um, argues in Queer Minstrels for the Straight Eye, 
um, queerness is um, for the queer of color always about adjacent an antagonisms within the social, including but not limited to class and race. The process of disidentification is made possible by the very incompatibility of gayness and blackness. Munoz defines disidentification thusly. Disidentification resists the interpolating call of ideology that fixes a subject within the state power apparatus. It is a, ref a reformating uh, of self within the social, uh, a third term that resists the binary of identification and counter-identification. Counter-identification, often uh, through the very routinized workings of its denouncement of dominant discourse, reinstates the same discourse. Um, Titus's, uh, Titus's use, uh, use of on inauthenticity can be understood as a strategy to disidentify from the dominant narratives of identity. Unlike Hank, uh, who serves more as a counter-identification I counter identificatory model um, in his pursuit of conventional masculinity, Titus does not strive toward authenticity, um, whether, whether gay or black, um, and he actively de essentializes those identities, as can be seen from his coming out scene in uh, season two, episode 10. Instead of coming out as gay, Titus is supposed to come out as black to a group of cops. In so doing, Titus destabilizes existing tropes of authenticity, namely that blackness is a readily legible signifier which needs no coming out, and that gayness is achieved only through that imperative rite of passage. Uh, so you conclude on this example? What? You, you're concluding on this example? No, no, I actually have a segment, and uh, I have like one more minute of text. Um, so in Empire, Jamal's strategy um, is similar in certain respects, but operates through a different channel. Um, he displaces the notion of authenticity from masculinity onto class and onto his identity as an artist. At the beginning of season one, uh, Jamal is beset by doubt with regard to the authenticity of his art. And in order to find inspiration, he moves to an underprivileged neighborhood much resembling the one in Philadelphia where his parents um, started out. The displacement of authenticity from masculinity onto social class and art allows for a rapport of identification between Jamal and his father and brothers, uh, which had thus far been impossible. It just so happens that at the same time, his brother Hakim and his homophobic father Lucius uh, have trouble finding inspiration too and go to Jamal for advice. The consensus created between the characters successfully bypasses the apparently unbridgeable chasm between masculinity and gayness. As I have tried to show in this paper, black gay characters who are systematically disqualified through impossible double binds are still often represented as trivial, fraudulent imposters whose identities are instrumentalized to stabilize the identities of others. Their seemingly impossible claim to a consistent and stable identity may seem an unresolvable dilemma but the complication of their identification processes um, also allows for them to resist the dominant narratives of identity and, as Janet Mock would have it, to redefine realness. Um, and I don't think I have time to show this clip. It's the coming out. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's worth okay, yeah, I think it's worth it. Uh, if it's working. God damn it. You're about to see junk, you better put away the corner, sister. Officer Jermaine here has been pacing the neighborhood and breakdancing in the cemetery. I was being chased by a moth. Anthony, that is uncalled for. Hey, Dad, I know you don't do big speeches, but maybe Titus has one prepared. You want to come after this guy's flex? I will need a microphone, a face towel, and some live butterflies. The gay picture. Designs bigotry as two different size stick men, and you circle the larger one for the big sound. And then you draw a tree. Why are you treating me like this? Because this is an Earth straight astronaut. This is the gay planet. I mean, black planet, white 
astronaut think about it? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not Elmo? Because we all can learn about tolerance. Hey, what's that? A real Right. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.